We're on? Okay. Well, dear friends, welcome to Williamstown First Baptist Church. We're glad to have you here with us this morning for our Easter Sunday celebration service. And dear friends, we have multiple reasons to celebrate this morning. Of course, we're celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're also celebrating the fact that one of our own, my beloved wife Diane, is now home with her Lord and King and Savior. Hallelujah. Friends, I'll tell you one thing that I know for sure. God is good. Do you know when God is good? All the time. 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 Hallelujah. And all the time, God God is good. God is good. We, we praise him. We thank him for Diane's life. We praise and thank him that she knew her Lord. She, she was certain of her salvation. She knew where she was going. Our salvation is not a hope so salvation, dear ones. It is a certainty. It is a certainty. For those who confess that Jesus is Lord... That he came as the eternal king, the eternal son of God, died for our sins to purchase for us an eternity free from sin and free from death. We know these things to be 100% true. Amen. So naturally, we grieve when a loved one passes. We're, We're saddened. We don't know how we're going to pick up and carry on, but we know that God has a plan and a purpose and that his purposes are being fulfilled in this world. Amen? Amen. 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 So, dear friends, let's begin this morning, as is fitting, with a call to worship, to worship our God and our King. Amen? Amen. We're going to be reading from the book of 1 Corinthians. Chapter 15, 3 through 8, which is in the front flap of our bulletin. And I'd like you to know something about this particular piece of scripture. Many Bible scholars believe that this particular passage is a creedal statement that had been being used by the church in that time in the first century to communicate the basic truths of the faith to newcomers. That's what this statement of faith is. And before we read it, I just want to point something out to you. I had a conversation with a dear friend yesterday. We were talking about Easter and the significance of Easter. And he said, oh, well, you know, it's, it's wonderful to have that, uh, the symbolism of resurrection and renewal. And I said, no, no, no. No, it's not symbolism. Because Paul, the Apostle Paul said, if Christ is not risen from the dead physically, we of all people are most to be pitied because our faith is in vain. So with that thought in mind, let's read 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, As to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Hallelujah. Let's pray, dear friends. Father, we thank you that you've given us these infallible proofs of the personhood, of the work of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, let who Jesus is for eternity burn in our hearts and minds convict us to our very the very core of our being lord 
so that in times of trouble, in times of distress, in times of joy, we would cry out to you, my God and my King. Hallelujah. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Dear friends, stand and sing. <laughs> I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart You ask me how I know He lives He lives within my heart With all the world around I see his loving care And though my heart grows weary I never will despair I know that he is leading Through all the stormy blast The day of his appearing Will come at last Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he Rejoice, rejoice, O oh Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. Hallelujah! The hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving. So good and kind. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. Salvation to him. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my Sit down for a moment. Carl's going to lead us in corporate prayer this Easter morning. Good morning, everyone. Happy Resurrection Day. Um, 
Got a few things to highlight on the prayer list. A um, couple of praises. Diane, whose knee is healing up, and she's doing good. Praise the Lord for that. Um, also, Carrie Ann's mom, who's healing up, is going along really well. And so I think we should owe some praise to God for that. Um, also, we got Debbie, Barb's sister, who has cancer, returned. So keep her in prayer for Barb and all her family. Um, also, I know Andy's neighbor, Ernie, passed away last night also. So he's struggling with that. And keep their family in prayer. And, of course, Tom goes without saying our you know, we all, all our hearts go out to you at this time. And I know it's just the beginning of your healing that's going to take place. Um, also, we're praying for Cobble View Road in Williamstown. And we're going to be praying for Dan Lamperin of Florida Baptist Church this week. Pray that all the people on Cobble View Road will come to know the Lord. And maybe they'll come across our path and we can you know, be ambassadors to them, and also for anybody in Florida. Um, I also wanted to highlight that, you know, in the insert, we got the churches coming this summer. Keep that in prayer, that, you know, we can minister to them, and they can minister to us, and God's glory will shine through it all. Do we have any other prayer requests today? No. <laughs> That's odd. Oh, Elena? <laughs> Praise the Lord. That Walter, Elena's friend, is home. So we're going to say that that's due to our prayers, I hope. <laughs> in God's mercy. Okay, let's go to the Lord. Lord, you've heard the requests that I put forth today. I know there's many others, and you know the ones that are needed, and you know how to handle all that. So I pray that you will do all these things in our prayers, and I pray that in this coming week that we all have a time to... Uh, you know, especially today being Easter, that maybe we can talk to some of our friends about the Lord and, come, and maybe bring them to salvation. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And if you stand and join us, we're going to be singing, Christ the Lord is risen today. Redeeming work 
work is done. Hallelujah. Fought the fight, the battle won.
feet of him who brings good news good news announcing peace proclaiming news of happiness our God reigns our God seated, turn to page 885 of your pew Bibles, and we'll be looking at Luke chapter 24, and we'll be continuing along the Jericho Road, and I'll explain that in a second. So Luke chapter 24, and I'll be beginning with verse 13. And what we're going to do is go through that, and as we go through it, uh, talk about it. Uh, So what we'll do first is pray. And Father, please bless this time. 
Bless this time, Lord. By your Spirit, use the time that you've given us in this place. Bless each heart here and that may listen on YouTube. Bless our hearts that they would be open to what you would say. If we don't know you as Savior, please call us into the family today. Make yourself known. Draw near to us, Lord. And if we do, then thank you, Lord. This has already been expressed by Tom and Carl. Thank you for the hope that we have in you. That no matter how difficult this life may be, there is a better place to be. And we look forward to that day. But for the moment, Lord, bless this time. Cause our hearts to rejoice. And give us a direction for our lives. In Christ's name, amen. And so I will ask the question that seems to come from the text, Luke chapter 24. We have two disciples, and it begins with verse 13, talking about the fact that that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Well, what was that very day? That very day was Resurrection Day. Except at that point in time, the disciples still did not understand that the Old Testament had pointed to the fact that the Christ must die and be raised. And so these very two were walking away from Jerusalem, walking away from the resurrection. They had heard about it, but didn't understand it, and they were walking away. Verses 1 through 12 give us what they had heard on the first day of the week, early dawn. They, the women, the very first witnesses to Christ's resurrection, went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, found the stone rolled away, so went in, but when they went in, did not find the body of Jesus. And while they were perplexed, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here he has risen. He has risen. Remember how he told you that he would. God is true to his word. He told you that the Son of Man himself must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day rise. And the women remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest, including the two here on the road to Emmaus. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles, but these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe. And so that very day, the two of them were leaving Jerusalem. And so I guess my question for each one of us here is, where are you going and why? You're being presented once more this morning with the fact of the resurrection. The resurrection is one of the most historically defensible truths in all of history. You are once again being presented with the fact that a man rose from the dead. A man rose from the dead. And since we all know that we're going to pass, we're going to die at some point in our lives, wouldn't you think 
that if people heard that someone rose from the dead, the very first thing they do is try and make sure that it was either true or not. Because it's not something that depends on what I believe. Jesus rose from the dead whether I believe it or not. It's either a truth or it's not. See, and if it is a truth, if it is true that Jesus rose from the dead, wouldn't you think I'd want to hear what this man said while he was alive? But for most of us, if we don't understand it or we disbelieve it, we walk away. We walk away from the truth in our lives. We walk away from the implications of that truth, which we don't know because we do not seek to understand. What we do is what these men did. They talk to others and they have debates. Just like we see it. I marvel at the fact that when I was a kid, I'd watch a football or a baseball game. They'd have one announcer. They'd have one person after summarizing what happened. Now you have six people beforehand talking about what might happen. And then you have six people after the fact talking about what they thought happened. And I'm thinking, I saw it. I don't need somebody to tell me what happened. But see, that's what we do. We have something and we go to colleges and colleges, I've been there, colleges love to debate. Well, what's your opinion? Friends, I don't care what your opinion is. I want to know what the truth is. And so they were leaving, and they were talking with each other, verse 14, about all these things that they had heard, as you might well do when you leave this morning and go to your Easter luncheon. Might talk about, well, talk about that sermon. Talk about Christ. Did he really? Is that possible? Is that something we could even believe? And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. In the Greek, it's what's called the divine passive. God prevented them from understanding. Of course, they weren't expecting him. And his body now, his resurrection body, was the same, similar but different, had the marks in his hands as he showed Thomas. And so Jesus said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And many times in scripture, God draws near to reason with us. See, he wants to have a personal relationship with each one of us. And it's not something he's going to force upon us. He's going to come to us and he's going to say, let's have a conversation. It's like it says in Isaiah, come, let us reason together. He wants to engage your mind. Because Christianity, the idea of the resurrection, who Jesus is, is logically defensible. And he wants to engage our hearts and minds in a conversation about that particular truth. That's why Paul says in Romans, don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Not that you may blindly accept whatever you hear, but that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. He wants to engage you in conversation about your life, about where you're headed. He wants to talk with you. And it makes sense. Look at the illustrations he uses all through scripture. He's called our father. Fathers are told to train their children up in the way they should go. In Deuteronomy, they're supposed to teach them when you're walking by the way, when you're standing, when you're sitting, when you're lying down, basically all the time, you're supposed to be having a conversation with your child, which means today you need to set the phone down and look each other in the eye and have a conversation and say, this is what I think and why and why not? Oh, let me Google it. No, you're not gonna find this on Google. 
you need to have a conversation with me because you need to wrestle with this in your own mind and believe it, whether it's true or not. And then act on what you find. Act on what you find. Don't be conformed to this world. They have their own opinion about what's possible. Don't be conformed to the culture around you. Reason with me. I am Yahweh, the Almighty. I am God. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Reason with me, the source of all intellect. In the book of Acts, the Bereans were commended because they received the word with all eagerness. Again, not blindly, but they examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Now, God might draw near to you in a variety of ways. You know, for me, it was through a brother and sister. It was through a book called Power for Living that was put out by the DeMoss Corporation talking about where are you headed and how can you live? Because if your life's messed up, you need some ability to change. And I couldn't change. I needed somebody to help me change. And so God, through family, through books, through friends, through a preacher on a pulpit who said you can't become a chicken by sitting in a chicken coop once a week for an hour, and you can't become a Christian by sitting in church once a week for an hour either. You need to have a conversation. And frequently God will do that in our hour of confusion. When he's talking to them, they stood still and they were looking sad. And then they go on to explain, are you the only one who doesn't know what happened here in Jerusalem? Remember, this was the time of the Passover. Thousands and th thousands of people had to come to Jerusalem for the Passover by mandate of the law. Lots of people. And they had seen him right in the previous week. So are you the only person that doesn't know what happened over the last few days? And so Jesus says, wanting to continue the conversation, what things? I love talking with my granddaughter because with young kids, you can ask questions, and they're very honest. See, when we get older, we learn not to be honest. We learn to say what's expected or what's acceptable. See, but not with my granddaughter. And not here. Jesus says, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth. That's where he was born. I'm Chuck from Cheshire. A man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. And our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death, crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. See, their hopes were dashed. They had an expectation, a wrong expectation. Because they thought the Messiah would come and deliver them politically. Not from their sin, not personally. I'm okay, you're okay. I don't have to be delivered personally, right? That's what we all think. They had a wrong expectation. And when it didn't meet their expectation, their hopes we're dashed. Okay, so let me stop for a second and ask, have your hopes been dashed in your own life? Did you have wrong expectations about something in your life? You know, I give you one that's easy. When I first got out of seminary and came here, you know, you're in seminary with all these people who love the Lord and you're, you're fervent and you're preaching and you know the word of God is going to excite people and draw people. And so you think you're going to go to a church and you're going to begin preaching. And pretty soon there will be a thousand people and then three thousand people. And then five years later there's still twenty-five. My hopes were dashed because I had a wrong expectation. See, because God doesn't call us to be successful. 
He calls us to be faithful. And there's a big difference. To be faithful, what gifts have you received from the Lord? Are you using them for his glory? Even if there's no evidence of success, are you being an ambassador for Christ every day to your children, grandchildren, friends, neighbors, co-workers, whatever circle God has put you in? Are you being an ambassador for Christ? See, that's what God asks for, faithfulness. And then when it pleases him, he'll make that faithfulness successful in a worldly sense. So expectations for marriage. Oh, we're going to get married. What a wonderful guy. Of course, when you get married, I've heard people say you ought not date very long. Well, Elena and I took that to heart. We dated for four days, got engaged, and got married two months later. No, I don't suggest that when you're younger. <laughs> you know, because, partly because we were older and we knew that we had to be honest with one another to have right expectations. And so you talk about everything you think might be a problem. And after seven hours of conversation, in one day, Four days later, we got engaged. But we had to have right expectations. But many of us come into a marriage or a job, and we have pictures of success and wonderfulness and how this is all going to be working out. And then you find out the person you're married to puts the toilet paper on the roll the wrong way. And that's a simple example, I mean, obviously. You know, we just find, oh, maybe, boy, we're not 100% in sync. See, wrong expectations. And they had wrong expectations about what was going to happen. And so then when they find out the women come to us and they amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning when they didn't find his body. They came back saying they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. He was alive. A dead man was alive. That's not possible. So I'm not going to believe it. That's not possible. And so some of us went to the tomb, found it just as the women said, but him they did not see. See, now in Jesus has found out why they're crestfallen, what hopes have been dashed, What expectations have been incorrect? And now he's going to address them. And we think of Jesus as being someone who will say to us, Oh, come here, honey. Let me talk to you. You know, you have your text right there before you. If you're reading with me, what does he say? Oh, foolish ones. (laughs) Oh, foolish ones. Foolish in the sense of being slow of heart to believe. We don't know whether these fellows had doctorates. See, wisdom does not come from education. Wisdom comes from the Lord. Not saying you shouldn't get an education. But always remember that all you're receiving is information, almost as though you had a permanent connection to Google. All you're doing is you're downloading all this information. What do you do with it? That's wisdom. And that takes time. That takes conversation. Oh, foolish one, slow of heart to believe. All that the prophets have spoken. So not only is Jesus saying to them, listen, the women spoke the truth. I rose from the dead, although they don't yet know it's him. But they're also saying is, partly that's because you don't believe the Bible. You don't believe scripture. You don't believe what was written in the Old Testament. Because what was in the Old Testament was this, verse 26. Was it not necessary, the word there 
is they in the Greek. It's necessary, something that has to happen, must happen. When Jesus had to go through Samaria, the same word is used. He had to, he must, it was necessary for him to go through Samaria. Why? So he could see the woman at the well in John chapter 4. He had to. He intended to meet that woman that day and to bring her to a knowledge of him. Think of yourself. The Bible says that God controls all things. That means it's necessary for every single one of you to be here this morning and hear this text and this message. Not the messenger, the message. See, this is God's word. All I am doing is putting it out there to you. You can read it for yourself. Wasn't it necessary that the Christ should suffer, be crucified, and enter into his glory, be resurrected? The Old Testament told us these two things were going to happen. We know crucifixion from Isaiah 53 By oppression and judgment he was taken away. As for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. In the book of Daniel, after 62 weeks, an anointed one, same word for Messiah, shall be cut off and shall have nothing. The Old Testament said the Messiah was going to be killed, was going to be crucified. Psalm 22 talks about the dividing of Christ's clothes, about his bones not being broken. The Old Testament prophesied this, and it also prophesied the fact that he would rise. And so they were slow to believe scripture and not just the women. And Jesus took opportunity and he went back to Moses. Moses wrote the first five books, so he could have gone back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, the promise that was made that there would be a descendant of the woman who would crush the serpent's head, even though the descendant of the serpent would bite the heel of the woman's descendant. Could have gone back that far. He interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So if you've ever read the New Testament but forgotten about the Old Testament, you can't do it. Because the Old Testament talks about Jesus. And it talks about how much God loves us and what he's willing to do for us and how patient he is. Because God is the same with all his children. Just as he was patient with Israel, he'll be patient with us. And so, these two fellows on the road to Emmaus got the best teaching. I wish I could have been there. Christ telling us what scripture meant. Wow. So now they were drawing near to the village where they were going. And Jesus acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. Have you asked Jesus to stay with you? You know, you hear all of these things, One of the things the book Power for a Living encouraged me to do was to have a conversation with the Lord and say, Lord, please come into my heart. Please stay with me and change me. Change me. Help me. Change me. I mean, it advised what I should do. If you're going to have a relationship with somebody, it's got to be two-way. I read his word. That's how he speaks to me. I pray to him. That's how I speak to him. And he teaches me in his word what his expectations are. He's my father. He's given me this. Our father, before he passed, 
wrote a little biography explaining some of the things in his life that happened from the time he got married. It was pretty cool for a child of my father because I remember it as a 10-year-old. Now I'm hearing it as someone more mature. Well, the same is true for each of us because as we grow in faith, we understand things better in Scripture the second time around, the fourth time, the tenth time. You know, my father's stories, you know, he was Irish, so he was a storyteller. And by the time he died, we could repeat verbatim what he was going to say once he started into a monologue. We can do that with Scripture, can't we? The more we read it, the more we remember, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Then you have Jesus saying, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden. And God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, the more time we spend with our Father, the more we'll remember what he says and what he wants us to do. If we spend no time with God, we won't know God. Just as you're married, you don't spend time with your husband or wife, you're not going to know him. It doesn't matter if you have a wedding ring on. That's not a marriage. A marriage is two people walking together, sharing life, talking with one another, working things out. Arguing whether the toilet paper should go this way or that way. Or maybe you have two different bathrooms now in modern homes. That's marriage. That's conversation. That's what we do. We talk. We ask him to stay because God will not stay where he's not wanted. He doesn't force us. God is a God of choice. Imagine that in our modern society. You need to choose. You need to choose this day whom you will serve. But for me and my house, Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. Choose this day. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Ask him to stay. They did. And as they spoke with him more, what happened? He went in to stay with them, and when he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed, broke it, gave it to them, and their eyes were opened. You know, again, God opened their eyes. We know any time we understand who God is, it's because of what God does. But he uses means, perhaps when he broke the bread, took the bread, broke it. Maybe they saw the scars on the hand. Don't know. But at that moment, they realized the truth. Jesus lives. He lives. He lives. And he vanished from out of their sight. And they said to one another, didn't our hearts burn within us while we talked, while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scripture? You know, if your heart is burning this morning, as I'm sharing this text with you, God is calling you. Don't refuse him because today is your day of salvation. You do not know when that next, or if that next, opportunity will come. God is speaking to you and saying he lives and challenging you, calling you into a conversation. Prove it. Prove it, right or wrong, but prove it. Because it's the most important truth in the world. And for them... What they did is what we need to do once we understand that it's true. They rose at that very hour, even though they were far away from Jerusalem in walking terms. And they returned and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And so then the two from Emmaus told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. And they shared that truth. And what happens when you share the truth of Christ in a fellowship like this, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be to you. 
Don't be hopeless anymore. Know where you're going. Know where you're going. God has a plan for your life, but you need to invite him in. You need to reason with him. You need to make sure that you understand the reality, the truth of this central fact. Jesus rose from the dead. Paul said, if Christ is not risen, then your faith is in vain. And we might as well go out and play golf. The only reason I stand here, the only reason we're here is because he has risen indeed and we share it with one another, with believers who know it, with those who come in, we try to encourage them, we share the truth and we hope God will change their hearts and that their hearts will be burning and they will ask the Lord to come in and sup with them, eat with them, live with them so that they too can then be ambassadors for Christ and everywhere they go, share the good news. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, just as he said. Let's bow our heads. Father, I just pray that we'll all believe all in this room, all that hear this, I pray will believe. I pray that you will convict us of our need to challenge this truth if we don't believe it. To grapple with it. To reason about it. Not to let it go. Because Lord, your rising from the dead is a promise that one day it's possible for us to rise and be with you forever. And unless you rose, that will not be true. Help us, Lord, to reason together and to come to a knowledge of truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand and we'll sing. God. 
Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for being with us this day. Thank you for showing us from Scripture the majesty and the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, may we all be convicted and convinced of this one central fact, that Jesus is alive, and so shall we be with him. Watch over us this week, Father, until we meet again. Hold us in the palm of your hand. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Happy Resurrection Day, brothers and sisters. We will see you next week.